Hey guys, good morning and welcome back to this Bible study in the book of 1 John where today we are closing out the book of 1 John. It's so good to have you coming in, hanging out with us. Um, should the Lord tarry, I'll meet you back here again next week, God willing, and we'll start 2 John. But without anything else, let's go in and let's close out this book of 1 John. Uh, I'm going to do something, though, first. I'm going to take us to Isaiah 46, verse number 9, and I'm going to read, I'm going to pray, and let's go. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from the ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this word, God. Let today be about you, God, and magnifying your name. God, help me to be as little as possible. God, and let you just be you. Uh, God, I thank you for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's kind of dive in. So last week we did one verse, uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things, can you tell? I still want you to memorize that verse. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. I'm really wanting you to memorize that verse because last week was big. We were locking down this idea of secure eternal salvation because that's exactly what John was saying. And you know, we talked about last week, the people who preach you can lose your salvation uh, it, you know, you, you gotta look at, they, either they really don't understand how to actually exegete the Bible, how to read, how to look at present and perfect tenses, and they, or they just don't understand the very language that they're actually reading here. Or I really came back last week, and I think this, I feel, is the most predominant, it is the fact that this person has a very small view of God and a very high view of themselves because they've made salvation so subjected that they're just free to come and they're free to go and God, God's not really a God in control. He's just, they've got a different view of God than what scripture paints of God. And I think that's just it. The problem with everything in the world today, the problem in our churches today, we have a very, very low view of God and such a very high view of ourselves. And we've got it all backwards. I say it all the time, but I mean it. You know, the two hardest truths, there is a God and you're not him. And if we would all just lock in and get that established, man, we could go so far in terms of these Bible studies. But here in Isaiah chapter 46, I read it for a reason. Remember the former things of old, for I am God. And yes, I can see the italics in my new King James. I know the am isn't there, but they put it in there so you could understand the Hebrew. For I am God, and there is no other... <laughs> That means you're not a God either. And that's what we've kind of done is elevating ourselves. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. God establishing himself, declaring the end from the beginning. <sighs> I wonder what's going to happen. God just started this and it's all out of control. Again, the people who talk that way have a very, very low view of God. God says, declaring the end from the beginning, there's no mysteries for God. God knows everything because God has, well, let's just look at it. Declaring the end, that means he he's the one writing history. We're just watching it unfold. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and guys, this is kind of big, and I will do all my pleasure. In other words, everything that happens, everything that happens, God has a plan and a purpose and it's being carried out god has a plan and a purpose and he's not sitting up there and things are out of control and him wondering 
I wonder what's about to happen down there. He didn't just set some marbles in motion, and now he's sitting back waiting to see what happens. The people that preach and teach like that have a very small view of God. And so getting this plan and purpose of God and keeping that in the backs of our mind while we read this book, it's going to help us. So last week, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know. Stop right there. So the word know, you know, that's been this thing we've been talking about. Like, it's either 39 or 40 times in uh, 1 John. I haven't went through and counted them. Uh, But I feel like that's somewhere pretty close. 39, 40 times, John keeps saying this word know. A lot of times John has used the word gnosko. And gnosko is this knowledge by experience. It's this knowledge whereby you live and you learn. The longer you're a part of this Christian faith, there's certain things you've just experienced and you've come to know and you've come to see about God. Time, that's cool. But now he uses a different word here. The word for know here he uses is oida. Oida is a different kind of knowledge. That's an intuitive knowledge, and we've had this conversation before. But here's the thing. John is going to finish out using the word oida exclusively. So it's kind of interesting. Here he is, 90 years old. He's been writing this letter to us, wanting you to know if you really are a Christian or if you're deceived, maybe even the deceiver, John's trying to make sure you know what a real Christian is and you know if you are that Christian. John has went to great lengths to do this. And so now John is saying that if you are this Christian, there's a few things you know intuitively. God just lets you know. God pressed it into your mind and into your heart because you belong to him now. So you know, and one of those things you know present tense, today, tomorrow, and the day after, we know, we know that we have, excuse me, know is perfect tense, making it even better, but we know that we have present tense, we have eternal life. God wants us to wake up tomorrow and know that because of our salvation, tomorrow we have a life that doesn't end. The day after and the day after, this assurance of our salvation, John wants us to know that because, hey, quite frankly, how do you wake up and face tomorrow if you don't know who holds tomorrow? It's it's pretty difficult. If you're going to wake up every day scared you're going to lose your salvation you're not going to be able to live. You're going to spend your entire life gripped with fear of hell. And why people preach that, there's a variety of reasons. Either just complete lack of knowledge, the inability to actually read Scripture as it's written, uh, or they even have like their, again, small view of God, or maybe it's even like a selfish desire that that's how we keep you in church, and that's how we keep the money flowing in, and we keep this organization alive. A variety of things, right? And so now in verse 14, now this is the confidence, and we've seen this word confidence before because we've already seen it. John's already talked about this confidence, this boldness, paresia, this ability to where you stand before God, head held high, arms wide open, ready to embrace, and it speaks of we have this closeness to God as believers. It's almost like this intimacy where we're a part of his life. Oh, wait a minute. That was exactly it, right? We get to call God Abba Father. There is this relationship that we're looking at here. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know. So notice this here. No, no, that whatever we know that we have petitions that we have asked of him. So now it seems John wants us to know. So let's look at what John wants us to know, closing this out. John wants us to know that we have eternal life. He wants us to have eternal security in knowing and trusting in the name of Jesus that that is our salvation. And that's how I know however today goes, 
I know my salvation is secure, not in anything I've done, but in the name of Jesus Christ himself, in everything that he is, nothing to do with me. And now he says, I want you to know something else. I want you to know that since you belong to God, you can go to God with a boldness in your prayers by which you're able to go to God and you can just allow your heart, you can allow your heart to pour out to God. Now, some people take this verse and they instantly, boom, they are gone with it. Lord God, I need a new car today. Or some of the TV guys, one million dollars. Lord, I'm praying for a financial miracle today, Lord. And all that stuff is blasphemy and lies. And that's what it is. We turn prayer into, we turn prayer into our divine little Christmas list. It's like writing a list out to Santa Claus. And, and you know, we say this, and I don't mean a lot of you, a lot of people have genuine prayers. It is, it's prayer for health. It's prayer for, but, but we miss something here. We miss something big. Notice what the confidence the confidence in the prayers that we have, the confidence is what? That if we ask anything according to His will, and that's what the most important thing is here. So the outcome, the goal of prayer is that through our prayers, we change and we conform. Our prayers change and our prayers adapt. Because it starts becoming the longer we pray and the more we pray, we fall into God's will. In our prayers, we start to pray God's will. Well, doesn't God will that I have a million dollars? No, that is not God's will that you have. Again, stop watching the TV. I know you're on YouTube right now, but... but Chances are you're probably a part of our church sitting at home or at least somebody that's a friend of mine watching this now. The will of God is not that you be rich and that you be wealthy. Matter of fact, if anything, we can quickly look at, you've heard me define the will of God on this Bible study and in our church probably almost every week for two years at this point. That's hard to believe we've been doing this for two years. But you've heard me talk about God's will for going on two years. And I'm always saying, I'm always saying it's the mission statement of our church. It's a pretty good mission statement for a church, right? Because I figure that as a church, if our mission is to see God's will carried out, then we have the confidence, oh, exactly what John is saying, then we have the confidence here that God is going to see His will carried out. So what is God's will? It's our mission statement of Mountain View Baptist Church, to see souls saved and lives changed. That's God's will. Jason, why would you, how, how are you coming to this? Okay, easy. Take a little trip with me, would you? Second Peter chapter three and verse number nine. Second Peter chapter three and verse number nine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but who? Some? No, wait, all should come to repentance. We see God's desire to see people saved. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure Peter's got that down 100%. How about 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 3? We've already been through this in the Bible study. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires... Oh, wait. It's kind of like Peter now. What is it that God desires? What is God's will? What is it that God wants? Who desires... Some men to be saved, a few men to be saved. God, <laughs> sounded like a monk chanting for a second. God desires what? All men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. It is God's will to see souls saved. And so in our prayers... We instantly know that when we are praying to see lives get saved, we're praying for this. 
we know that this is a prayer that God is also, God is a part of this prayer. We know that we are praying in God's will. Uh, you know, it's one of the oddest things, like uh, I'm always giving people uh, that are not the praying type, I love that. Uh, people who are not Christians will be like, hey, you're pretty close to the God, could to God, can you pray for me? And I'm not talking about this Christians, we pray for each other, making supplications. We're told to do that. These are people that are not Christians that will come to you. And a lot of you, you've had to have had this experience. And now I'm going to go back. What kind of a light are you shining if, you're, if your non-Christian friends don't ever come to you and ask you to pray over stuff? Guys, I remember when I used to be on Facebook years ago. I, I saw the same thing all the time, too. The people always, you know, you'd see somebody on there, please, uh, everyone pray for me about, and the people saying this a lot of times are the same person that had uh, profanity-laced, uh, just horrific worldliness. Like, you know, like, when we're in the world of being fruit and specters, you're looking at this person, and you're like, you got no fruit, you got no fruit, therefore you got no root, and the root is Jesus Christ. So all I can say is, it does not look, this is me loving you as a real friend. You're not saved. And so now look at this person that's not saved. Here's the thing. You're asking me to pray about whatever the thing is in your life. The thing is, I'm not going to pray about finances. I'm not even going to pray about your health. I'm going to pray that you get saved. Because here's the thing, I know whatever may be going on in your life, God is doing and working in your life in such a way as to see people get saved. Like in my own life. In my own life, if you just looked at me pre-salvation, things looked pretty bleak. I mean, my life had become, I was a total wreck of a human being to the point where any day I wasn't going to wake up. I was working towards my own destruction. And the thing is, you could have prayed a million prayers for me, but the only prayer that really mattered was the prayer God was working to see me get saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So as we pray, we can have confidence if we pray in God's will. God's will is to see people get saved. Well, well complete. There's got to be more to God's will, right? Right. And we say it every week on here. God's will is to see souls saved and lives change. Well, Jason, where are you getting that from? Well, it just so happens I've got scripture to go with it. What does I say every week? Uh, I'm just on here reading the Bible. How about Ephesians 5 and verse 17? Ephesians 5 verse 17 real quick. So 517, Therefore do not be unwise... Don't be a fool. Don't be foolish. Don't be, you could even translate stupid here. Do, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You see, the will of God, people are always say, I'm looking for the will of God. The will of God is not this elusive thing you can't find. Matter of fact, the Bible's pretty sound. And look, guys, we could probably preach three weeks on the will of God instead of like 10 minutes in the middle of this message. The will of God is made pretty well known throughout this book. Uh, and also what's made well known throughout this book is it appears the problem is not in knowing the will of God. It's typically we know the will of God and we just don't want to obey the will of God. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of God is. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, Remember, that was the former cultures people came out of to worship. That was how they worshiped their God, have drunken orgies. That was their, and Paul is quick to say, guys, this, this other junk, the things you did before salvation, that's all got to go. If you're still being controlled by the things that were in your life before you were saved... Well, I'm even going to wonder, we're going back to root and fruit again. You're not to be controlled by the junk that was in your life before you were saved. But Paul says, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
but be filled. Ah, uh, can I say it's plurao? Plurao. Yeah, I was trying to remember. It looks like plurao, but there's like an accent above the uh, o, so it's plurao. Now that we've got that insanity out of the way, so what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit that he says by here? Simply put, it's almost like imagine a glass, and if I just started pouring the liquid out of this, which I'll pour the liquid into me for a second. I know I normally don't uh, drink like this, but I was a little dehydrated this morning. But it literally refers to like a pouring and this filling, it's not static, but it's a continually being filled and filled. And you're like, well, I only got so much space. Well, maybe then we should say you get filled to the point that you're running over at that point. You get filled to the point. But the idea is imagine a set of balances with two cups on there. If you're just listening to this, it's me swaying back and forth with my arms out. Imagine a balance with a set of cups on there. And one of those cups represents the Holy Spirit in your life. And so imagine that cup continually being poured into, continually being poured into, continually being poured into. Uh, I just spent an entire week doing a crash course in physics. And we always talk about things end up moving in the direction of a net force. That's exactly what the filling of the Holy Spirit is. You are continually being filled, continually being filled so that your life is, yes, you have an unbalanced life, but you are unbalanced in the direction of the Holy Spirit. So it is God that is leading you in your life. It is God that is filling you. It is God taking you where you need to be going. It is God in control of your life. And therefore, you can't be the same. <laughs> Your life is going to be different. There's going to be a change. Verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making a melody in your heart to the Lord. Guys, when God is just pouring into your heart, you just can't help but be bubbling over about what God has done in your life. Giving thanks always for all things to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Guys, we spent a lot of time in the last year talking about this, this submission of a believer. Why do we do that? We do that because our lives have been changed by this filling of the Holy Spirit. Paul doesn't stop. Wives, submit to your husband. Wives, you cannot submit to your husbands. It's against, we go all the way back to when Adam and Eve and to the fall. Right there, when God laid down his curses, God laid out this strife that would be between man and woman. And this strife will never be conquered until you're filled with the Holy Spirit and your life begins to change. And wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church and the Savior of the body. And so we go on to see that the husband, you can't be a good husband unless your life is filled. When your life is filled and your net force is moving in the same direction as God would have you. But how about this? One more verse. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I could almost start in verse 1, but I'm going to start in 3. Because he literally opens and says, For this is the will of God. And I thought it was a mystery. I thought I was supposed to live my whole life wondering what the will of God is. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Because as you're filled and your life begins to change, there should be a difference. Your life should not be the same today as it was for me. I've been saved 11 years. If I did not look any different today than I did 11 years ago, we've got problems going on here. Because God's will is to see souls saved and lives change. When you get saved, he doesn't want to leave you where you are. And so, guys, we tie this together in our prayers. Like I said, people people pray, and we pray for things, but the goal is we continue to pray, and we continue to pray until we were. We find ourselves praying within God's purpose, 
and within God's plans, we find ourselves to the point where we and God are in agreement. And that is because it's we that have changed. Guys, the bottom line it pulls down to is this. If you're sitting there praying to God about something today, but you've never made that first prayer whereby you've said, God, you're my Savior, then everything else is just noise. It is all just noise. Psalm 66, verse 18. The psalmist says, If I regard inequity in my, in my heart, the Lord won't hear my prayers. Until I... And guys, this is even for the believer. If you've got something whereby you've got a strife in your life, God's not listening to your prayers. So therefore, when we read that, and I know, we're, we're, where are we? Verse, wow, we have did what? Mm, three verses now today. Yeah, knuckle that, right? If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin, oh, now we're at verse 16. I can't get anything right today. We've only done two verses today. So the goal is we know God is going to answer those prayers that are according to His will. And the goal is for us to find ourselves in His will of seeing souls saved and lives changed. So we make those prayers. And then, as clear as everything else has been, He makes this statement. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask, and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. And now it gets really interesting. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. And now we come up with this fascinating topic of what is this sin leading to death? And even though we've just been told to pray and we can have confidence in their prayer, it appears that there is one type of sin and whereby this one type of sin, you can pray, but the thing is, your prayer is not going to have any effect. What? <laughs> and it appears as if there is a sin so we can pray for a brother and a sister that, let's say, is backslidden or, or, or something going on in their lives, but it appears there is this other kind of sin, and we can have confidence in one sin where we pray for lives to change. We can have confidence that this brother, this sister, should they be the brother and sister they say they are, that they come back from whatever's going on, and we can have confidence. We have confidence because... We know that God wants to see souls saved and lives changed. But now, time out. Now it appears there is a sin in which there is no coming back. And so our prayers for this person will have no effect. All right, time out. Help me out. What is this I should not be praying for? Or if I do pray, it doesn't matter. My prayers are not going to be doing anything. God wants us to have confidence in our prayers, but it appears I don't want you to be surprised about one thing. And so this sin unto death, this is, I can't sit here and say I know this exactly, uh, but this is like the two big views. And the reality of it is I almost feel like maybe things are intentionally left this way because both of these things are truth. So in Mark chapter Mark chapter, I wrote down Mark chapter 3 in my Bible, but I'm not sure if that's right. I know Matthew chapter 12. I'm going to flip there real quick and double check my own notes in my Bible. If I was good, I'd pause the camera at this point. Let's make sure. I don't want to say this. Mark chapter 3, a great multitude follows Jesus. I, mm, yep, Mark 3 verse 28. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. Okay. But he who blasphemies against the Holy Spirit has, never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. So we see one type of sin, one thing going on there. And if you don't remember what this sin is, you can also go to Matthew chapter 12 and read about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had just cast out demons and some Pharisees are watching and they're like, you got Satan in you casting out those demons. And Jesus replies, 
you've seen the very work of the Holy Spirit of God. You can talk trash on me, guys, but you just saw the very Holy Spirit of God working firsthand, live and in person, and you had the gall to look at that, and you had the gall to give the miracle that is the Holy Spirit. You gave that credit to Satan himself. And so so Jesus was like, you're done. And guys, and, and I believe this. I believe there comes a point. I believe a lot of you heard my testimony. I, I said that I wouldn't have made it a week. I was in the last week I was going to live, May 1st, 2011, when I got saved. And so the bottom line of that in there is, is exactly, I've said this a hundred times, God put me and he gave me one last, what are you going to say? So that when I went and stood before a judge one day because we die once and then comes the judgment when i stood before god god was going to replay a million opportunities i had for salvation but he had me that one last opportunity he had me right there where i would look at this pastor if you died right now you go into heaven or hell so blunt i was asked there's a fly on the camera (laughs) So blunt, I was asked the question. And if I were walked out of that office, I would have been dead within a week. And I'll also tell you this, I would have been eternally damned for the rest of my existence. Because I do believe they are those that God has given their chance and they have sealed their fate and they have... They have turned their back. They've seen God lived out in front of them. They've sur- sur- survived miraculous events. They've seen God lived out in front of them. You see God in creation itself. And through all of this, your heart hardens and all you do, all you do is refuse. And, and you're not a part of it. And you've had your chance. There's also the chance that this could be a brother or sister in Christ, like Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. Paul talked about those who have gone on to be asleep uh, because they abused uh, the Last Supper. Uh, they were getting drunk on the communion wine. And because of their unworthiness, God took these believers out of the world. Ananias and Sapphira took them out of the world. They lied against the Holy Spirit of God, and God took them out. And so there could be the chance that this sin unto death is a believer that has something going on in their life. They've got something going on in their life, and because of the shame and what it would bring to... It's just that when I sit here and I hear that, in my mind, I've seen a lot of things go on in the church that I I guess standing back, I have to say, God, shouldn't you be taking this person on home? So, yes, no, I don't know. Uh, I would be sitting here lying, but I think both of those are distinct possibilities. This person that has sealed their fate, their heart is hard, they've seared their conscience, And they're not going to listen. They're out. Very real possibility. Also a very real possibility, this person that is a believer and just won't come back. You know, maybe we've already, we've put them out of the church because they just won't repent of whatever this sin is, whatever it is. And God decides to go ahead and bring them home at this point. I believe God can bring you home for one of two reasons. Your work is finished or you just have a flat, unrepentant spirit about you. There's something going on in your life and you refuse. Of course, there's that other little part of me is like, man, that sounds like somebody living in habitual sin. And if anything, I've learned that person's not really even a Christian. Either way we look at guys, we say there's a danger. And then when God's mind is made up, God's mind is made up on that person's judgment. So John is saying, I don't want you to sit there and be like, but God, I prayed so hard for this person. And God doesn't want you to sit here and think that he was slack concerning his promise. His promises were real, but this person was against them. 
verse 18, we know that whoever we know, or eat it again, intuitively we know whoever is born of God does not sin. See, this goes with what we just said, this present tense. When you have been born again, you can't live in a habitual sin. It just doesn't go along with this habitual sin. It's just incompatible with you being reborn in Christ. But he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. I don't think my King James, New King James, does a very good job here. But he who is born of God, capital H, as in he who is born of God, Jesus, keeps him. And so now we're back to eternal security again. He who is born of God, referring to Jesus, is the one who keeps you. And and then John 4, 4, greater is he that is in you than who is in the world. And he says, the wicked one does not touch him. You're in the hand of God. We know, so he wants you to know one more thing. I don't want you to not understand this. We know that we are of God, but the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The rest of this world, it's Satan's. When you watch news and you watch TV and you see everything that's happening, don't sit there and wonder what's going on because the world itself is under the sway of the wicked one and we're told we're supposed to be separate from that. And he wants you to know that God will protect you. So does that mean something like I'll never suffer a bad? No. But we... We, we always talk about, but God is working all things together for the good for those who love him. And guys, I hate to say it for the millionth time, but that good may not happen in this life. Contrary to what the TV preacher says, that good is not promised you in this life. And we know, oida, yet again, and we know that the Son of God has come, present tense, meaning he's here right now today he's come and he's never left and he's given us an understanding that we may know (laughs) oida again that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his son jesus christ this is the true god and eternal life Notice how he keeps saying, him who is true, who is true. This is the true God. John's driving home that there's only one Jesus and there's only one way to heaven. And you've got to have the right view of God. You've got to have the right view of who Jesus is. Go back to 13. You're saved by the name of Jesus Christ. All that all that he is, all that he is. There is one way to heaven. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. What does John mean when he closes out? Keep yourselves from idol. Keep yourself from anything that you raise above God. Keep yourself from anything that you're trying to base your salvation on that is outside of God. If you've worked out your own way to heaven, whatever this is you've fabricated as your way to heaven, that's an idol. We just saw this idea of the one true God. If there is anything you've created that is outside of the one true God, that replaces him as your source of eternal life, then that's an idol in your life. Anything elevated above God is an idol. If you're hoping for your way to heaven on anything else, it's an idol. Any other way to heaven... As we close the book, John has set it down very soundly. I want you to know, I want you to have confidence. 
I want you to know you're saved. I want you to have confidence in your prayer life that if you pray with the will of God, you will see those prayers answered. But I don't want you to be surprised in the case of a couple of situations where you're not. I want you to know I want you to know that the only way to heaven, the only way to heaven is through belief in the one true Son of God. And that anything outside of that, you're putting your faith in an idol. You've constructed your own way to heaven. John closes out the epistle so that you can know right now today Guys, I hope that at the conclusion of this book, at the conclusion of this video, you never again ever, this concept of a hope so salvation, never again is a part of your life. But if you sit here and you've watched this today, and you don't know, if you, if you can't grasp this intuition, this, what God has given a believer on the inside, maybe you're not a believer. Maybe you don't feel like your prayer life has been successful. Maybe you need to get saved. Maybe you need to confess your sins and come back to a right relationship with God. I don't know where you are today, but I do know this. God desires to see souls get saved and lives change. He wants to save you and He doesn't want to leave you where you're at. Guys, I love you. I pray for you. I don't know where you are, but know that you've got a God looking out for you. Go to Him. Father God, we thank you, God, for this day. God, we thank you for this study, God, in First John. God, I thank you for the assurance of my salvation, the assurance of my prayer life. God, I love you and I praise you always. And if there be anyone who watches this, God, that doesn't know you in the way that John's described, smash their heart into a million pieces, God, where they find themselves calling out your name. Lord, I love you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, guys, I love you and I'll see you later. Bye.